Have you ever read a bio biochem passage on the MCAT and just thought to yourself, was that even English? The apparent complexity of these passages can be extremely overwhelming and can make us feel stupid, despite the countless hours that we put into prep. If this was you, don't worry, because I felt the same way, and I have some efficient strategies that will help you overcome it like I did. Arvin from MCAT Mastery here, and today I'm going to share some bio biochem strategies that ultimately got me a 130 in this section on test day. This video will cover how to do content review for these topics, how to effectively read the passages, and effectively read the questions. So first, in terms of content review, I would suggest starting biology biochem review pretty early on in your prep because of the sheer amount of content that is in this section. I recommend getting a content review book set. Uh, personally, I used the Kaplan book set because I felt that things were explained pretty thoroughly but concisely at the same time. And whenever I was confused by the text, I would just consult YouTube videos and watch a video on the topic. One thing I struggled with in the beginning of prep was taking good notes. And I'm not one that really enjoys writing things down. So although that I had a notebook, the amount that I actually wrote in it decreased as time went on and I got lazier. As a result, I felt that information was just kind of falling out of my head as I learned more. To address this, I started making my own cards on Anki and using the principles of active recall and spaced repetition that were allowed through Anki, I was able to learn the material much better and keep it for the long term. This approach allowed me to solidify all the content for this section. Now, when it comes to passages, this is where most of us find issues. Biobiochem is difficult because it tests the relationship between many different genes, proteins, and etc. within the passage, and it's easy to get overwhelmed with all the terminology that's in the passage. Let's take an example. Let's say you had a passage about a protein called ABL. So you would have to understand what this protein was, and then you have to understand the mutated protein the passage talks about called BCRABL and what this mutation implies. Then you need to interpret a graph contrasting the two, then understand what the correlation between the inhibitor is with it and how the mutation changes it. And all in all, it just gets really overwhelming. To address this, we need to make a mental model of the passage. These complex and confusing terms like ABL and BCR ABL could very well just be called banana and mutated banana, and your understanding of the passage would not change. Likewise, for each term in the passage, there is a particular role that each thing plays, and rather than getting lost in the terms, you just need to understand the role of each part of the passage. It's really hard to talk in abstract about this concept, so let's just show you a passage um, and how I would go through it and make a mental model as I went through the passage to prevent myself from becoming overwhelmed. Okay, so this is our passage um, about ABL. We talked about a little bit in that example earlier. So um, I encourage you to pause the video and try this passage before I go through it, um, just to see how, how your thinking is, and then unpause the video and, and we'll go through it. So what we're gonna do is first just take a little glance over the whole thing. You know, we see a little graph here. It looks um, like Michaelis Minton. So we're thinking about some inhibitors here. Um, and then we see cancer right in the beginning. So that's kind of our intro to our mental model. This passage is going to be about cancer, some connection with cancer. And then you can start thinking, okay, what do I know about cancer? Cancer involves um, proliferating cell growth, right? Uncontrolled cell growth. So there's probably something gonna be talked about like that here. Okay, now that we have that intro, we can then delve in and we're going to look at the terms that are presented and the relationships between those terms and how exactly can you make sure that you keep track of all of them. Okay, so let's read through it. Um, so traditional cancer therapy, so we're talking about cancer therapy in particular, um, targets rapidly dividing cells. Some of these drugs used in traditional cancer therapy such as cisplatin. Okay, so cisplatin is one of these cancer therapy drugs, the traditional ones. Um, it shows limited specificity for cancerous cells and affects diverse cell populations in the body, okay? So I'm going to think limited specificity. So when I associate cisplatin with something, it's going to be with traditional cancer therapy and limited specificity. Um, and now you got to ask, how does it do that, right? And that's what the passage talks about next. It's used for its ability to cross-link DNA, okay? So it cross-links DNA, which disrupt DNA replication and cell division, Okay. And so now we have an image about cisplatin, right? That's the first term that is given. We know that it has limited specificity. Uh, how, does it, how does it work as a cancer therapy? It does cross-links, right? It makes cross-links with DNA, which dis disrupts DNA replication. And that's how it works, right? So now we have an idea of what cisplatin is. And those were traditional cancer therapies. Now we're going to talk about some other kind of cancer therapy. Um, particular to what we were doing. So recently, cancer therapy has targeted a mutate, mutant kinase protein. So I see kinase, and I immediately think 
ATP, right? Kinase proteins require ATP, um, known as BCR-ABL, okay? So BCR-ABL is a mutant kinase protein, okay? Cool. This fusion protein is a product of this mutation of this chromosome, which occurs when chromosomes 9 and 22 undergo a reciprocal translocation, okay? So that's a lot right there, but what I'm seeing is that BCR-ABL exists. How does it exist? Well, it exists from the fusion of um, the chromosomes 9 and 22 through um, what's called a Philadelphia chromosome. Okay, so that's what it is. Now we have to contrast it to what the non-mutated version is, right? What is what is the mutation cause? Well, unlike the normal product, ABL, BCR-ABL is constitutively active, okay? So we have ABL here introduced, and now we have a difference. So ABL is inactive. It doesn't work as a kinase. It just, in it's an inactive form, and needs to be mutated in order to work as a kinase. So that's what we see here. The mutation enables it to work. Um, BCR-ABL is involved in signal transduction pathways that lead to the activation of various downstream effector proteins. Um, it influences both cell division and cell migration. I see those terms, and I think, you know, this is excellent. This is exactly what... Um, makes sense because this is a product that will be targeted by cancer therapy. And if it influences both these things, that means it has a strong role in cancer. So it makes sense with our mental model so far. Since cancer cells rapidly divide, BCR is an excellent target, like we said. So now we'll just pause, okay? Um, try to think about what we just went through for a second. And then what we saw was that there's cisplatin and BCR, ABL. So these are the two things that we're dealing with. So um, with cisplatin, that's a traditional therapy. BCR, ABL is non-traditional and it's doing these things through a kinase protein. So that's the difference between the two. Um, now we're going to talk about a new chemotherapeutic agent called imatinib. Okay, so that's, it says it's a therapeutic agent. And so we can contrast it actually to cisplatin. They're both treatments. Um, and so it acts as a small molecule, as a specific inhibitor of BCR-ABL. Okay, that's another contrast right there, right? It's a specific inhibitor of that, which makes it different in the sense that it's specific versus this that had limited specificity. Um, and that's another connection you can make. So it's part of this larger family of inhibitors and competes with ATP for a binding site on BCR-ABL. Um, imatinib is a very effective treatment for patients with chronic, um, with this leukemia, which is cancer of the white blood cells. Um, which most often harbor a Philadelphia chromosome, meaning it has BCR-ABL. Okay, so what we saw was that it competes with ATP for a binding site, okay? So we still need to figure out what kind of um, inhibitor it is. That kind of gives you a little bit of insight, but we wanna be completely sure. So we'll hold off on that. And CML involves the proliferation of these cells, which give rise to white blood cells derived from the bone marrow. Okay, so now we have all our terms, okay? So you take a pause and think about, all right, we have cisplatin, we have BCR-ABL, we have ABL, and imatinib. These are our four different things that are presented in this passage. Cisplatin is a traditional cancer therapy. Imatinib is this new cancer therapy that is an inhibitor. Um, and it operates through BCR-ABL. So those are kind of the connections that we're making and forming a mental model in our head of how they're related. And if you want, you know, you can write these things down in the beginning to make it a little bit easier to navigate. So um, now... We have a little figure of how that translocation happens. So um, pretty straightforward, ABL and um, BCR, they, these chromosomes switch up a little bit. And now we have this graph here. And so this would scream Michaelis Minton to you. And what we're seeing is, you know, Vmax here does not change, but KM does change. And that should tell us, um, based on our no knowledge of inhibitors, that this is a competitive inhibitor. Um, and so that's what we're getting out of this passage. Imatinib is a competitive inhibitor um, that works through this BCR-ABL pathway and is a cancer therapy. This therapy is then contrasted against this traditional therapy called cisplatin. And that's kind of our network that we're making out of this passage that is basic, but enough to proceed with the questions and then consult the passage if we have any particular doubts. Okay, now that you understand the passage, let's move on to the questions, which are their own challenge in themselves. Sometimes questions in these sections can be extremely long, and these are typically the ones that are based on an experiment. These ones in particular for me can be kind of overwhelming because there's just so much text you need to deal with. Luckily, now that we've made a mental model of all the terms in the passage, they can't throw us off with these terms in the question. When reading through the questions, it's important that you pick out the key points and phrases that give you hints into the answer choices. 
When you get down to two answer choices, picking out the key points and phrases in the answer choices then becomes very important. Let's go back to this passage and use this to knock out these questions. All right, so now we're gonna go through the questions and we wanna make sure we look for keywords. So let's look at this first question. Which of the following scenarios is most likely to occur in cells of patients with the Philadelphia chromosome? So um, keyword here, Philadelphia chromosome, right? Before we even go to the answer choices, we think Philadelphia chromosome and we think of BCRAVL, right? The activated kinase protein, okay? So these situations are incorporating a cell that have an activated kinase protein. And that's the lens through which we're gonna go through these answer choices. All right, so A, the presence of an extra copy of chromosome 22 leading to more transcription um, of the BCRABL gene. So extra copy of chromosome 22, there is no extra copy. And we can tell by this diagram right here, there is no extra copy present. So we can cross that one out. Okay, accumulation of activated protein substrates downstream of BCRABL due to decreased phosphatase activity. There is no indication of phosphatase activity. And so it's hard to deduce this one. Um, and it's kind of a stretch, right? There's no way for you to deduce something about phosphatase activity, um, even though you're giving given kinase activity. So that is a stretch. I'm not completely ready to cancel that one out, but um, I'm, I'm not that believing of that one. An increase in the ratio of phosphorylated to dephosphorylated substrates downstream of BC, BCRABL. So Again, we said it's a kinase protein, so it's involved in phosphorylation, so that makes sense. There's an increase of phosphorylated substrates um, downstream to that. So that, that one I can go with. This last one, decrease in phosphorylated substrates downstream of BCR-ABL causing withdrawal from the cell cycle, okay? And entrance into the G0 phase. Here, the G0 phase is kind of my key word right here. The G0 phase, from how I understand it, is a phase where there's no replication happening. When you think about cancer, that's the exact opposite. You have a lot of replication happening in cancer. Um, so there's no way that G0 phase is going to happen because it's these chromosome, these Philadelphia chromosomes um, are more cancerous. So it would not enter G0. So I can confidently cancel that one out. Now we're left with these two. Um, and since this is talking about phosphatase right here, and that's kind of my keyword, you can't make that kind of... Um, extrapolation based off of this. That, that's too far because all that's given you is kinase and you can't make generaliza generalizations about phosphatase. So I'm going to go with this choice right here, um, increasing the rate, ratio of phosphorylated because it's the most straightforward with regards to kinase. And that is correct. Oh, imatinib, right? If we remember correctly, imatinib is a inhibitor. It is a competitive inhibitor and we can use that to narrow down our answer choices a lot. So question is regarding imatinib competes with ATP for a binding site on ECRABL, what effect would increasing ATP concentration have on the kinase activity? So we're increasing ATP concentration and asking what impact that would have on the kinase activity. So again, we said it's a competitive inhibitor. And in that situation, imatinib is binding to the binding site um, instead of ATP. And so if you increase the concentration of ATP, there will be less imatinib, right? And so there will be more likelihood for ATP to bind. So it's possible to go to a certain point where you get enough ATP where there's so little imatinib that its effectiveness as an inhibitor is not um, allowed because of how much ATP there is. So there's a lot to deduce. You know, you can think of think that through. Um, and if not, you can, you know, just go through the answer choices and see what fits best. So by increasing the concentration of ATP, the relative amount of bound imatinib can be effectively reduced to negligible levels. So that's basically exactly what we said. Um, by increasing the ATP level, there's going to be so little imatinib that it's not even going to be competitive. So that's that's probably your best answer right now. An increase in ATP will lead to phosphorylation of imatinib by the kinase BCRABL. Um, no, so the kinase um, is not phosphorylating imatinib. There's no phosphorylation of imatinib. And by looking at this phrase, I'm going to cancel this this. Um, answer choice because that is not what happens. Because imatinib is a competitive inhibitor, increasing the concentration of ATP has no effect. That is incorrect. What we said was that it does have an effect. Um, and we can see that through the graph, right? They're, they end up at the same place. It's just um, the initial rate. In accordance with Le Chatelier's principle, increasing ATP concentration will lead to an increase in ADP, resulting in the phosphorylation of fewer substrates by BCRABL. This one is tying in a chemistry concept um, with the attempts to confuse you, right? That does make sense. You increase ATP, it's going to shift equilibrium to go to the other side. But we aren't talking in this case about 
just Le Chatelier's principle. We're talking about inhibition. So this answer choice is trying to show, throw you off by introducing a different concept. But we are talking about inhibition here, and this does not play a role in that. And so that, with that, we can cancel this answer choice out. And then we're left with A, which is the answer. We'll do one more question. Um, which of the following effects would most likely appear in a CML patient undergoing cisplatin treatment and a CML patient undergoing imatinib treatment? Okay, so a couple terms here that are very important. We have CML, and then we have cisplatin, and we have imatinib. So first, CML. I kind of forgot exactly what that stood for, so I'll check back in the passage. And it has a role in leukemia, right? The um, white blood cell cancer. So we know that there's some effect in white blood cells for both cases. So undergoing cisplatin treatment um, affects these cross links, right? And we see it's affecting all these things, the bone marrow and everything. The matinib we see also, right? Here we're talking about these cells that give off white blood cells. So what I'm seeing is white blood cells a lot of, right? So then we look through the answer choices, right? We'll look for something in common that says white blood cells. So an increased risk of bacterial infection, um, that does make sense, right? You're dealing with a case where there are less white blood cells. So an increased risk of infection makes sense because there are no white blood cells to fight it. So I like that answer choice. Reversal of the Philadelphia chromosome mutation, there's no talking about a reversal. Um, and so that's our keyword there. There's no reversal that is happening. There is that chromosome mutation, but there's no reversal. Um, and this actually only happens in this imatinib case, not in this one. Then we have covalent bonds between strands of DNA. If you remember correctly, there's cross links in this one. There's no mention of that here. So this, this bond idea right here doesn't make any sense. There's no covalent bonds um, talked about here. So we can cancel that one out and we'll cancel that one up too. Anemia due to lower levels of circulating red blood cells. See, this one is a little trickier because it does talk about, you know, the concept of blood cells in general and, you know, bone marrow and hematopoic stem cells, which are all, you know, related to blood cells. But being particular about red blood cells is kind of difficult because we don't talk about red blood cells in particular. Although we do mention blood cells, we're not talking about red ones. So the only ones we see in particular are white blood cells. And we see that said here and um, we see it mentioned here with the bone marrow. So because there is you know, an effect on white blood cells because it is leukemia, it is the increased risk of bacterial infection. And that's the right answer. I hope that this helped. Um, I know it was kind of long, but I feel like this process of going through it can really help um, by finding these keywords in the choices. I hope that that example helped conceptualize the proper way to read these passages and questions. A more general thing I found myself doing included taking deep breaths between passages. I found myself getting really mad whenever I was confused in the passage, and this anger would kind of cloud my vision and make me perform less on my future questions that I saw. To clear my mind, I started taking deep breaths whenever I felt like this. Taking deep breaths can feel kind of weird initially, but I think it's kind of underrated how much of an impact it has. If you practice it effectively, it can really help you to keep a level head during your exam and to keep you from feeling overwhelmed. Finally, it's extremely important for you to reflect on your mistakes, so please check out our video on effective self-reflection for more information on that and how you can be self-reflective during your prep. Biobiochem aside, we know how hard this whole journey can be. There's just so much to know, and we weren't taught the strategies to learn all this in school. But you can do it. We were in your very shoes at once, and we felt the same way that you do. But what we can tell you is that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Myself and other tutors here at MCAT Mastery have learned a lot through our journeys through the MCAT, and we've put together a step-by-step -step MCAT strategy video course showing you exactly how to apply a lot of these high-yield learning strategies to increase your score to the top score level. It's just a super comprehensive system to master the MCAT, complete with strategies from every section on the test, as well as strategies for retakers, non-traditional students, and more. I really wish we had something like this when we were taking the exam, so if you're interested in checking it out, I'll link to it below, along with a lot of our other free resources. We're also available for one-on-one -on -one tutoring, so if you feel like you need some individualized help, we've got you covered. In conclusion, nailing the section on the MCAT requires a complete understanding of not only the content, but also effective strategies to approach passages and questions. I hope that this video helped, and I know that you got this.